We're set to begin a series of lectures now uh, in our uh, electric machine design course, a new set of lectures, and this set of lectures covers uh, what's known as permanent magnet brushless DC motors, or by their new name, the uh, most recent name, uh, PMAC synchronous machines. These uh, types of motors have been around since the early 60s because of basically because of the Apollo space program number one and number two because the availability of high performance permanent magnets namely the rare earth and the uh, these early motors in the 60s were developed by uh, Sperry Farragut and Kierfot and uh, Sperry Farragut used uh, electronic commutation with photoelectric switches photo emitting diodes and uh, phototransistors to do the commutating and Kierfot used Hall effect switches. Many companies over the years have developed products uh, and, and uh, brushless products using magnets and, 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 and as magnets and electronics improved over the next 20 years along with the development of motors things progressed to where they are today. By the 1980s DC motors became the favored uh, machine brushless DC motors became the most important motor for the emerging computer peripheral products like printers tape drives floppy disk hard drives and later CD DVD drives it seems that in the 70s IBM passed a law for the computer industry that thou shalt not use an AC motor inside of a computer or any of the computer peripherals and one of the main reasons for this was uh, uh, because uh, uh, AC motors are their speeds controlled by frequency and DC motors their speeds controlled by voltage and uh, different countries had different frequencies so so if they developed their products they would have to have different uh, number of poles in the motors for 50 Hertz operation overseas or 60 in the United States or uh, if they didn't change the number of poles they would have to change belt and gear ratios and things like that to get the speeds to come out the same. So it was easy for them to use DC motors. They couldn't have brushes or commutators or slip rings because of life and because of, of noise, uh, uh, electronic noise that would glitch the logic. So brushes became popular. So by, by, uh, by the 80s, that's the only machine that was used and that included the cooling fans in the, uh, in the computers as well. They were all brushless. By the, by the mid-90s, the names of the PMDC motor, uh, BLDC motor, was changed to uh, PMAC synchronous. They were the same motors. They were cousins of the DC brushes, but, but because they were powered with sine currents instead of DC voltages switched across the, the leads, they were powered by sine, sine voltages and currents like AC induction motors, so the inverter people changed the name to PM uh, AC synchronous motors. But uh, a lot of people think the motors are different, but they're not really. Uh, there's a lot of versions that have emerged since then, axial flux, slotless, uh, and, and internal magnet versions, as well as the uh, classical surface magnet versions. The shaft torque again, just like other motors, is produced by the flux leads from the from the permanent magnet, the rotor, uh, with the flux from the permanent magnet rotor with the stator phase conductors. The speed is uh, is not it's not really a true synchronous motor in the classical sense in that uh, it it it's 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 a synchronous machine if you uh, ex if you realize that it's a self synchronous machine it has to have knowledge to to make it synchronize to make it self synchronous the rotor or the stator has to the stator transistors have to have knowledge of where the rotor is so that it will fire the right polarity of current to flow in the phases to properly link the flux from the rotating uh, rotor so it's self synchronizing and it doesn't have any slip the rotor pole angle positions can be estimated uh, pretty close, but uh, they classically they've been measured using some sort of a shaft mounted encoder feedback or or the modern uh, IPMs. You can calculate the rotor from the from the measured uh, quadrature and direct axis inductances. 
for surface mounted machines these two inductors are almost the same so it's very hard to uh, uh, discern uh, where the rotor is from the inductance very high torque densities are uh, are very possible with these types of machines as long as the number of poles are pretty high uh, the PM machine as we've said before is the closest you get for getting something for nothing in this world because once you pay for the magnets and have them put in the motor you get this field from the magnetic field from the magnets forever uh, uh, let's see so the uh, another characteristic we've mentioned before is the number of poles in the stator don't have to equal the number of poles in the rotor like they do other machines the there's different versions of these there's the axial flux versions can be configured with a rotor stator rotor on the shaft or a stator rotor stator or just a single rotor and a single stator with uh, where the plus signs are is where the axial flux uh, travels the uh, transverse flux topologies can be single or dual gap these are very complicated uh, configurations but very useful the most uh, common ones are radial flux machines uh, and, but of course there are linear versions of all these as well the uh, uh, the the uh, the radial flux machine can have a surface magnets. Here's the SPM or our internal magnets, uh, the IPM. Uh, the surface magnet, all the torque is produced by the flux linkage of the magnets to the stator conductors. The IPM motor uh, has two torque components. It has the torque component created by the flux linkage of the magnets, but it also has an additional torque component from the reluctance torque generated by the saliency of these poles in between the magnets. These are salient poles. So you could call the IPM a hybrid permanent magnet brushes because it produces a reluctance torque and a magnet torque. Here, here's a very nice picture of a uh, of an induction motor stator with the with half of it showing the a proper eight pole permanent magnet rotor and the other half showing a proper uh, eight pole uh, squirrel cage induction rotor and as you can see that the stators are uh, identical here the windings are identical the axle flux machines have the variations we talked about before here's a a, a uh, rotor stator rotor this is a haul back array type rotor with no iron. This backing, there's no back iron required for this. There's no. The only iron in this motor is the shaft and the bearings. Uh, this is carbon fiber backing plate, and this is the magnets uh, that provide the haul back array. And and there are carbon fiber spokes here to support this. And a three phase Litz wire uh, winding configuration is is what's in the stator here. Okay, there's obviously a bearing inside there, the shaft, and these, these things rotate together. This is another version here with a rotor, stator, rotor. Here's a version with a stator, rotor, stator, two stators. This is the easiest one to cool. It's easy to take heat off of the back of this. And, and this is another rotor, stator, rotor. This one isn't bad to cool either because you have the end turns going over the OD, which be in, can be in contact with an aluminum housing. This is what the haulback array uh, looks like. This very interesting concept. You you take uh, high energy permanent magnets, and uh, and you grind them or or shape them uh, uh, mechanic in, in a mechanical direction that gives their magnetic direction in form of the arrows. So so what you have is flux uh, going this way. So you don't need back iron, and you can. Uh, this is a 45 degrees. This is going outward. This is uh, going tangentially, 45 degrees and inward. So, so, so you basically cre create poles in the magnet, like this. It's quite an interesting concept. There's a number of motor designs that operate on this basis. The drawback is the expense of making all these magnets. Uh, now, the surface rotor configurations. Here's an example of one with the magnets here uh, uh, it's an eight pole motor I guess and now here's a surface magnet with arcs that's one choice with saliency here's uh, uh, arcs with no no uh, 
uh, outs on the outside. These are arcs on the outside. This looks like a DC motor, but it isn't. This uh, this thing here rotates, but it'll use magnets that look like the ones used in a permanent magnet DC motor. And this stator looks like an armature lamb. And so this is stationary, and this rotates. Here's some uh, other versions of uh, the same thing. Here's a inside rotor version. There's an outside rotor version, all the same diameters. These are the rotors that rotate, of course. And here's a bread loaf design. A bread loaf design kind of looks like a slice of bread, a funny looking slice of bread. But uh, that's the shape. It's flat on one side and has the, the curvature and uh, shaping uh, on the outside. Uh, this is a, uh, a radially magnetized. These are radially magnetized and they're put together to form a complete ring. Uh, the, there's some IPM, interesting IPM configurations here. This is a spoke type. In other words, the magnets are slabs and they're mounted inside of a rotor. This is a North Pole, South Pole, South Pole, North Pole, North Pole, South Pole, South Pole, North Pole. So the flux is focused and, and this area plus that area is a lot greater than this area. So the ratio of the, those areas times the flux density of the, that magnet is the flux that you get pushing into the stator to link the conductors in the stator. Uh, here's a, a, an eight pole version. Here's an eight pole version. This is, happens to be the Toyota Prius configuration and the magnets are shaped in V's to uh, to have enough surface area to get enough flux but they they need these salient poles in between so if this were straight across here the magnet surface wouldn't be as great so the flux would be less so that's why you put it in a V but uh, this has saliency from the quadrature axis as compared to the, the D axis this is uh, another version of that motor uh, let's see I believe this is a the uh, rotor that's in uh, one of Ford Motor Company's hybrid vehicles. You can see the punch lamination held together with these dimples, the stack, and then there's this little air uh, passageway. These are, are uh, the, the, this is a little web that holds this thing together. That's a web that holds it together. And there's the neodymium magnets inserted into the slots. Here's a similar design. This is a small version of of uh, the type of rotor that that, that Honda uses in uh, uh, some of their machines. It, they're IPMs too, but they don't have saliency. They, there's no steel in here. They intended this to be a surface magnet, but they they uh, fabricate it by punching the lamination so that it completely encases the lamb. That gives them uh, magnet retention is what that does. So uh, let's compare the IPM and the SPM. The surface machine uh, has the highest torque density possible with uh, permeance coefficients of 10 or more. That's the uh, ratio of the magnet thickness to the air gap thickness. Highest torque to inertia ratio is possible, which is uh, of any machine that is known. And uh, I suppose that can be argued, but as far as I know, that's a true statement. And this is very important. Uh, Characteristic for servo motors, simple construction but requires shaped arcs or bread loaf magnets. Highest torque linearity due to low leakage reactants of the surface magnets. Requires more magnet mass to resist demagnetizing fields. Limited constant power range due to field weakening difficulties. Many applications require uh, with surface magnets require retention sleeves. The IPM motor. Uh, consists of interior fitted permanent magnets inside a, a, a rotor core. Uh, there's an extra reluctance torque component uh, provided from this configuration. So properly designed, the magnet mass can be reduced over an equivalent uh, rotor uh, for a surface mount design. Capabilities of 8 to 10 to 1 uh, constant power ratio is very impressive. Magnet slabs are lowest cost due to, to uh, minimum grinding. They can be sliced and diced because they're rectangular slabs. Magnet retention is almost for free due to it being internal to the rotor laminations. Some leakage flux is present through the retention webs, but uh, uh, the retention is worth that loss, I guess. Rotor fabrication is somewhat more complex, but can be easily tooled and automated. 
Magnets can be thinner due to protection of being inside soft steel laminated poles for demagnetization. The control is more complex than surface, but can be justified by performance gains. This is a uh, picture of the uh, plot of the uh, reluctance torque component. This is a reluctance torque component generated by the IPM, and uh, it, it peaks at, uh, at uh, just, uh, just the right place here. And, uh, and this, uh, this curve here is the alignment torque plot. Uh, and that that uh, alignment torque is the torque that's produced from the magnets. Now, now the peak torque occurs when the sum of these two torque components is maximum, which is uh, uh, determined by uh, gamma, which is the uh, the current advance angle. And so you set that current advance angle at a point where the sum of these two is maximum, and that gives you uh, a uh, a torque. Uh, uh, component that uh, is maximum, and this is very important because uh, uh, this is this is what gives you the wide constant power range and uh, easy field weakening. So we'll uh, we'll study more about that later. But it's not this doesn't indicate that much difference. But I mean the reluctance torque is about uh, well, it's not it's it's about uh, the peak reluctance torque here is only about. 30% as much as the uh, alignment torque, but it is, I have seen designs where it's 50-50. The uh, stator requirement for these kind of machines is, is uh, just like an induction motor, and it can be, you can use the same stator for either one. Uh, the, uh, however, in selecting what kind of a stator you use, many times the cost dictates which one you're going to use. Uh, if you need real high slot fill, or uh, or if you have uh, uh, very high speed and a lot of pulls, you've got high frequency losses, uh, special winding patterns, and multiple phase connections have to be considered. Multiple phase means uh, two three phase circuits or three phase circuits, or uh, or special manufacturing reasons for cost of how you make the rotor, or, or how you fabricate the stator, but. In principle, you can use uh, a, a, an existing induction motor stator. Here's an example of a uh, pole number versus uh, torque density. As you can see, the uh, uh, with uh, four poles, you require a yoke this thick, just like in an induction motor. But if you go to eight poles, the uh, and and keep the OD the same, you only need half the thickness of the stator yoke so the id jumps from 150 millimeters to 132 and what that gives you is two things that gives you a larger radius so remember torque is a moment of force so if i generate a certain psi in the air gap i have a, a larger air gap and if i develop the same force in the air gap i get a lot higher torque density because the radius is different and the surface area is different and uh, of course, that the surface area is different relates. I've got more flux in the machine as well. So uh, uh, here's some examples of, uh, of uh, stators with, with high slot fills. We've seen some of these before. Uh, the, this, is a, this is a Ford uh, stator. It looks like an induction motor stator. This is Ramey's stator. This uses rectangular wire. And you can, uh, these are coils that are wrapped around a single tooth like this centered set of parts here. And you can diform these and compress them and get very high density. So uh, this concludes this lecture. We'll uh, go on to uh, more topics with Brussels motors uh, in the subsequent ones. Thank you very much.